If you watch old Star Trek episodes from the original series, the characters play out a recurring pattern. Something horrible is primed to happen. And Spock says, Captain, there are three million colonists on the planet. The ship carrying the bomb has only 400 civilians. Logic dictates that we destroy the ship before it can arrive. Then McCoy says, Damn it, Jim! Those are people, not numbers! You can't just talk about human lives like an equation! And then Kirk says, Maybe we change that equation. Make our own solution. Meet me at the transporter in five minutes. Bring a fun period costume and some space prophylactics. And then they save the day. Great show! McCoy is the touchy-feely guy. He's empathetic, passionate, immediate. He thinks in terms of people and suffering. He leads with his heart, which makes him view appeals to data and abstract arguments as cold and inhuman. Whereas Spock is the Logos. He's rational, calculating, empirical. He's looking at the situation analytically. And Captain Kirk provides direction and action. He mediates between the two and interfaces with the outside world. He answers the question, okay, which direction are we going to steer this ship? And occasionally, you get Mr. Scott, the engineer, the practical nuts and bolts and lithium crystals guy. Scotty's not debating ethical quandaries on the bridge. He's not concerning himself with oughts or ideology or feelings. He's focused on a very simple question. What works? What's optimal and efficacious versus what will fail or be ineffectual? When Kirk calls him and says, Scotty, we're stuck in a Tholian web again. Can you get us out? Scotty says, I, Captain, if we spray quantum lubricant on the hull and put the engine in second gear, we should be able to squeeze her out. Very good, Mr. Scott. Listen, if we have any more of that space lubricant left over, I, Captain, as per usual, I'll send it to your carters. Good man, Kirk out. Allow me to map gun conversations onto these avatars. Every gun conversation has multiple components. How you feel about guns, whether you hate them or love them, whether to you they represent death or freedom. That's McCoy. That's where America understandably is in the wake of mass shootings. Then there's the ideological conversation, the captain conversation, the big picture conversation of where do we want to steer the ship? What are the values which inform and constrain how the crew conducts itself? For example... Captain Picard is a stickler for protocol and the Prime Directive. When he encounters a planet of gibbering idiots who sacrifice pets and virgins to a robot deity, he'll say, The Federation would never presume to lecture a species on its values or the merits of its own culture. We respect your autonomy and traditions. Whereas Captain Kirk will beam down, kick over the robot idol, and say, Your god is a lie. We won't stand by and let syndicate beings relegate themselves to superstition and passivity. Everyone, meet me in the town square in five minutes. Bring period costumes and some space prophylactics. Captain conversations are about how we orient the ship, how the Federation ought to structure itself. One group thinks we ought to steer the ship towards a planet with fewer phasers. They want to put restrictions on who can buy phasers, what kind of phasers can be privately owned, and where and how those phasers are purchased. They think for God's sake, nobody on Betazoid even owns a phaser, and that's a great planet. It's just as free and democratic as Earth is, but suffers demonstrably less phaser crime. And even the goddamn Ferengi have universal background checks on semi-automatic phasers. We protect our freedoms here in the Federation through institutions and laws, not a permanent threat of revolt. And even if we did, are you honestly going to go up against Starfleet with its galaxy-class starships and photon torpedoes? using just a Type 3 phaser? The other group views phasers as a good thing. Phasers equalize power dynamics between female humans and larger violent Klingons. Folks living on outer colonies don't have time to wait for an Excelsior-class vessel to rock up whenever they get attacked by space monsters or raided by garden-variety space outlaws. And most importantly, phasers offer protection to planets in the event that the Federation ever goes fascist which interestingly has been happening quite a lot in the franchise of late. 
And while this pro-phaser group is not automatically opposed to some restrictions on phaser access, they are deeply suspicious of phaser control proposals in general, because such laws are usually suggested by people who don't understand phasers, don't like phasers, and would prefer to get rid of them tomorrow if they could. Most gun conversations are a dialogue between McCoy and Kirk. How do we feel about guns, and what is the big picture direction we think our country ought to go? And I find these conversations obnoxious. Here I'll be, in 10 forward, minding my own business, and somebody will sit down next to me and say, did you hear about the latest mass shooting on Rigel 7? Why can't we just have basic common sense phaser control? To which I will respond, I'm open to that. Uh, I'm, I'm very open to evidence-based phaser legislation. What do you have in mind? And then they'll say, well, I just think there's too many phasers and we should get rid of the scary looking phasers. And why should anybody have an automatic phaser? What possible purpose could there be for an automatic phaser? To which I will reply, well, good news there on that last bit. We effectively outlawed automatic phasers oh, 20 years ago. And actually, most phaser crime is, is done by handheld phasers. Well, I just think the earth is stupid. When Andoria had a mass shooting and all those pupa died, they instituted phaser control. And I'll realize. This person is very passionate, but they're not wanting to exchange ideas with me, let alone policies. They have a lot of feelings, and they're more or less wanting to kind of just flail in a general direction. But then on the flip side, there I'll be minding my own business at Quark's Bar. And I'll just say, I don't know, I'd be fine with a law that says you can't operate a phaser while drunk in public. That makes sense to me, right? That... You can have a phaser, you just can't discharge it while you're under the influence. And some asshole at the other end of the bar will shout, The first thing Gold Ducat did when he came to power was take everybody's phasers. If we give you space liberals an inch, you'll take all the phasers. And then I'll go, Hey, friend, I'm, I'm just saying I'd be fine with a law that prohibits you from operating a phaser while drunk in public. You could even get hammered and shoot space cans with a phaser on your moon farm. I don't care if it's out on your farm. You can get as drunk as you want. But if you're at a bar with a phaser, all I'm saying, I support a law that says you can't drink while you're there with a phaser. That doesn't strike me as that onerous. And then that guy will puff his chest out and quote Charlton Heston or some other former Earth president. So I generally hate these conversations. I find them useless and tiresome. I'm not sure they ever accomplish anything either, because it's difficult to argue with someone that they should share your feelings, which is a lot of the time what we're doing with these. Who gets left out of these conversations is Spock and Scotty. Empirical data and practical efficacy. That's what today's episode is going to be about. We're going to approach the topic of gun control from the perspective of Mr. Spock and Scott. Rather than approaching this ideologically, or by how we think the country ought to operate in regards to guns, we're going to enter a dialogue between Mr. Spock and Mr. Scott. We're going to look at the stats on guns first, look at the numbers, then say, what are the most effective ways we could bring down gun deaths? Which means we're going to tackle this issue from a different perspective than most of the other shows you're going to encounter on this topic, which generally start from an ideological premise, or perhaps just a cultural position, and then scrape data together to defend that. We're not really going to get into a captain dialogue like that today. That's for another show. Incidentally, because we are limiting ourselves to the efficacious and practical, we are going to also limit our analysis to that which might actually be possible. And we're going to concentrate on policies which we think would be effective. So, for example, in the wake of the recent mass public shooting, I encountered several think pieces that suggest uh, when other countries encountered similar tragedies, they confiscated all the guns. And the takeaway is, well, America should do what they did. And that is an interesting theoretical conversation to have. Maybe, if that were remotely possible, it would be an idea worth exploring. But that's the kind of topic we're going to have to leave to McCoy to wax eloquent about. If we're approaching gun control from the perspective of Spock and Scotty, mass gun confiscation simply doesn't concern us because that's not a realistic option. The Second Amendment, whether we like it or not, is the law to amend the Constitution. And by the way, I, for one, think it would be a great idea to at least make the Second Amendment more precise and less nebulous. I find it rather nebulous at present. 
would require not only the support of two-thirds of the House and the Senate, but also two-thirds of the states. So if your preferred gun control solution, your go-to gun control solution, is to just abolish guns or confiscate everything larger than a hunting rifle, that would require the cooperation of 67 senators, 290 congressmen, and 38 states to get done. Or those 38 states could theoretically bypass Congress and hold their own constitutional convention, but still 38 states, you got to hit, right? And right now, 44 states all have a right to bear arms in their own state constitutions. So if you want to opine about the atavism or the paranoia or the needlessness of the Second Amendment, that's fine. We can have a conversation about that. But I'm going to be over here today with Spock and Scotty looking at the available cards on our table that we can actually play, which could save lives now in this timeline on the planet where we live. If we had a national gun registry where your firearms are registered to you like a car, it would be a lot easier to track down criminals and enforce background checks. But I can tell you pretty much every gun enthusiast I have ever met thinks that a national gun registry is a direct prelude to gun confiscation. And they kind of have a point since everyone I know who wants a gun registry also would be perfectly fine with gun confiscation like they did in Australia or the UK. Maybe that's unfair. Maybe, maybe that is not at all what you want to do. But it's definitely what 2A Second Amendment people think. And so I don't, at present, I don't think that that's really a politically feasible idea. Although I can certainly see its use for law enforcement and background checks. And if you listening can come up with a way to have a national gun registry, I don't know, maybe something with a blockchain, you're smarter than me. It might be politically feasible to get those Second Amendment folks on board. But until then, it's a political non-starter. So we're not going to cover it in today's otherwise practical show. On that note, I'm actually going to convolute my Star Trek analogy a little bit more. I'm going to try and shake off a few more normies before we proceed. People who don't like Star Trek, I apologize. This is your cue to roll your eyes and leave. Everybody else, today we're actually going to have a three-way conversation between Scotty Spock and Mr. Data. Oh my God, this is the nerdiest thing I've ever done. Here's what I mean. When we put on our Spock hat, we're going to employ deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is when we come up with a theory, test it against available data, and formulate a policy based off of that. Deductive reasoning is a top-down approach to logic. So, for example, we will cover more guns means more gun crime. That's an exercise in deductive logic. We're starting with an abstract idea and then attempting to disprove it. If the theorem stands scrutiny, we can relay that to the captain and report we have logically deduced that fewer phasers means fewer phaser deaths. So, Captain, you should steer us towards a planet with fewer phasers. We will tackle that theorem momentarily. Mr. Data is a practitioner of inductive inference. Think specifically of the episodes where Mr. Data is in the holodeck pretending to be Sherlock Holmes. Again, I apologize to everybody who lost their virginity before age 20. He observes a piece of evidence, then based on that, formulates a hypothesis. Inductive inference is a bottom-up approach to logic. And we're, I'm going to try to rely on inductive inference, inductive reasoning today. Inductive and deductive reasoning are both useful. Love Spock, love data. But for our purposes, I'm going to try to go more numbers first inductive reasoning when formulating specific policies. That's because our mission is to reduce the largest possible amount of gun deaths. That's our primary aim. We're trying to solve for reduced gun deaths by the maximum possible amount. We could come up with a lot of logical theorems and then run the evidence against them, but a perfectly good logical theorem might still only apply to an insignificant amount of data. Our goal here is to reduce gun deaths by as much as possible, not to accumulate good but marginal gun policy ideas. Let me give you an example where logic is consistent but not impactful, what I mean by this. One of the gun control policies floating around is to require all gun owners to securely store their weapons in a safe in their home or to use a trigger lock. No loaded guns laying around, no guns on the wall, no guns under the pillow. Let's assume that there's a number code on these safes which you can unlock in a couple of seconds so it doesn't pose a big obstacle to home defense from burglars. The deductive reasoning is guns are a deadly weapon, casual access to guns is therefore access to a deadly weapon, Children should obviously not have accidental access to these deadly weapons. Therefore, if we require secure storage of such weapons, we limit accidental gun deaths, particularly among children. Further, many guns are stolen every year, and by definition, a stolen gun is owned by a criminal. 
We don't want criminals to have access to guns, so securing them in safes is a good idea. So far, so good. I don't have I don't have a problem with anything that I just said as far as a, like enacting such a law. But if we passed it and it worked as planned, which is a big if, we'd still only be playing at the margins. If all American gun owners began using gun safes and a gun safe stopped every accidental gun death, including accidents a safe would obviously not inhibit, like a gun going off while cleaning or some jackass playing Russian roulette with a revolver, we're looking at a maximum of around 500 people per year. And yes, many of those are lamentably children. 500 is about how many deaths by accidental gun discharge we have here in the States, according to the CDC. Obviously, those deaths are all tragedies, particularly when they're children. However, that number constitutes roughly 1% of gun deaths in the United States. If we're relying on inductive inference, looking at the overall data first and then formulating a policy based on that, we would start by looking for larger windfalls than 1%. 1% would be when we tackle the big stuff. We do the heavy lifting. Then we get down to the 1% stuff. Suicides constitute the vast, vast majority of gun deaths in the United States. If we're starting from inference, suicides are the first thing we would notice and try to reduce, followed by homicides. So we'll use some deductive reasoning up top, the beginning of the program, but mostly we're going to rely on inductive inference to formulate policy prescriptions, Mr. Spock and data. But we haven't even got to Scotty yet. Remember, Scotty is not a logician, deductive or otherwise. He's an engineer. He is principally concerned with practical implementation, not does this make sense, but will this work? Will this work well? Let's let Mr. Scott take a crack at the gun safe proposal. We're no longer looking at syllogisms or stats. We're just investigating the practical application. So in terms of sheer efficacy and pragmatism, how on earth would you enforce a gun safe law? Even if somehow police knew who owned all the guns, which they don't, again, there's no national registry, and also somehow they had the logistical ability to go to the estimated 51 million American households which have guns, or maybe they only did it, they had to accompany you after you bought a gun to your home and, and had to go check for a safe and they were issued warrants to enter the household. If all that happened, an irresponsible gun owner could take his revolver out right after the cops left and set it back down on his coffee table. I, I look at that and I'm like, I, it's not that I have a moral problem with this law. I just don't think it would be very effective. I, it would require the voluntary participation of morons and people that don't care about the law. And those, the folks that would do this, you're probably not worried about in the first place. Here's another Mr. Scott example. I've seen proposals which would limit the sale of guns that have large magazines. That is to say, ban rifles which can hold more than 10 rounds, that kind of thing. There's, we could get into data on uh, the amount of shootings that happen from handguns versus from rifles versus semi-automatics, but just looking, putting on our Mr. Scott hat rather than our data analysis, ammo cartridges are typically modular. What that means is that a lot of guns can accept a 10 round cartridge. They could, you just pull that out, you could slide into 50 ammo cartridge. It, it does, it's a plug and play. You're just plugging it in. Okay, well, then the next step would be well, why don't we just ban high capacity ammo cartridges? We'll, we'll limit manufacturers to make ammo that only comes in 10 round units, nothing bigger than that. Again, I don't really have a big problem with that. I, it doesn't morally bother me, but I am told by my gun enthusiast friends and the research that I've done is that if you have a drill and two metal plates from Home Depot, you can pretty easily make an ammo cartridge in your garage. Or as one guy colorfully put it, if you can cook meth, you can make a functioning magazine. So that law, while I understand the logic of it, I, I have a hard time thinking that it would be efficacious in removing ammo from the kind of people we don't want to have, it, the, the criminals, the people that are plotting out these horrible, horrible mass shootings usually for more than a year. I've looked at some of the data on this. Most mass shooters have planned for several months, right? So listen, cards on the table. I am not a gun guy. I don't have a reflexive reaction to gun control proposals. Uh, in fact, I am amenable to quite a few of them. But God damn it, I love Star Trek. And I've spent too much of my life idolizing Spock, Scotty, and Data 
to formulate dumb or ineffective policy proposals, or at best, pursue innocuous ones which don't accomplish anything when we could actually be saving real human lives. So I have spent the last three weeks researching the hell out of this topic. I have read over 80 articles, research reports, and policy briefs, and by God, I am going to do Starfleet proud. So you and I are going to explore policy measures which could theoretically pass Congress and judicial review. They're within the realm of possibility. And of those possible policies, we're going to try to identify the top most efficacious ones which would actually save lives rather than just emote. Okay, ready? Engage. Welcome to the Political Orphanage, a home for plucky misfits and problem solvers, armed or otherwise. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton, and I congratulate you on sitting through the longest introduction and convoluted Star Trek diatribe in the history of this entire program. Well done. Before we plunge into a very frothy policy episode, this program is made possible by listeners of the show. They do so via Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton. Hey, patrons, thank you for helping out with this episode. Last week, I put up a post on Patreon asking for policy suggestions that would be efficacious in reducing gun homicides. And a bunch of you, left to the task, gave me a lot to think about and to research and even politely argued with each other a little bit in what I will describe as the exact opposite of every gun argument I've ever seen on Twitter. How opposite, you ask? Of the some hundred responses that I received on the post or in direct messages, not a single one was in all caps. Amazing. This episode is absolutely smarter and better for your contributions, so I say thank you. And I also got to say, I am loving this whole have my own personal think tank thing. It makes my job a lot easier because I'm just one guy. If you want to join that think tank and you wish more people in media did massive deep dives into relevant topics instead of just shouting old bumper stickers at each other, and also you wish that they loved Star Trek, please consider going to patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton. As I said earlier, this episode took a massive amount of research. I, I read a ton of these things. I, I had conversations with more knowledgeable friends. I thumbed through a couple of books. And I'm also uh, happy to share all of that data, or at least the bibliography of my sources with anybody who wants it. So if you want to um, spot check me, or, or maybe just go to the bibliography and, and click on articles that you think would be useful to you, I'm going to make that available to the public. If you go to patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton, you will see that today's episode is a public post and I have put the bibliography underneath the show description. You can just go to that and anybody in the public can read it and I hope you make good use of it. But while you're there, consider supporting the show. Go to patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton. Not only will you make a research heavy and hopefully entertaining program like this possible, you'll also get bonus content. This week, Dr. Andrea Jones-Roy returns for a conversation with me and my buddy Charlie Landers about guns. Specifically, Andrea, a New York comedian, circus performer, and university professor, talks to me and Charlie, mostly Charlie, about why he is a gun enthusiast. It's one of those conversations you wish people had instead of screaming at each other. You can get it at patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton. Okay, we're back. Remember our mission today, crew. We are trying to identify policy solutions which would be the most effective at mitigating gun deaths. Although from a policy analysis perspective, we're already in trouble just saying that because gun deaths is an overly broad term. When we say gun deaths, we're talking about categorically different events necessitating different solutions. Allow me to illustrate. Let's say the crew of the Enterprise visits a planet with a massive, hellish animal attack problem. Every year, a whopping 45,000 inhabitants of this planet die from animal attacks. Mr. Spock, in a peak of deductive logic, might say, Not all animals are the same, nor are all animal attacks identical circumstances. Therefore, we will likely require different solutions to solve these different situations. So let's break that down. On this planet, 34% of these animal attacks are Gorns mauling people. 34% Gorns attack people. 54% of these maulings 
are people who want to get mauled, who jump into animal pits at the zoo to intentionally get eaten, and 3% of maulings are from rabid house pets. As a methodical Starfleet officer, while I am very saddened by people jumping into bear pits to intentionally get mauled, that does not strike me as an animal problem. That is a mental health problem. Chances are, if we try to solve that by focusing on the zoo animals, we muzzle them, we tranquilize them, cover their enclosure with force fields, the people who are going to jump into the targ pit are going to find some other destructive activity. So if my job is to mitigate animal deaths or animal-related deaths, animal attack deaths, I'm going to focus on those other two categories. The rabid house pets definitely get the most media coverage on this planet. People love their pets, and the prospect of a beloved house cat going rabid and killing you is both visceral and terrifying. All the more so because it's not out in the woods where we might expect to chance upon a gorn, but in our own home. What's more, a lot of the time, that rabid dog or cat mauls a child, which is particularly gruesome and heartrending. Obviously, the preferred amount of dead children is zero. However, as a policymaker tasked with mitigating animal attack violence, I must point out that the visceral instances of rabid house pets constitute 3% of these overall animal deaths. So sure, let's by all means come up with policies which will mitigate those tragic maulings. I am on board. But even if we solve those in their entirety, we have stopped 3% of needless animal maulings. We still have all these goddamn gorns running around. From a policy perspective, those guys are the first thing we should tackle. If we make even modest progress on random gorn attacks, we save thousands of lives. Whereas even Effective rabies policies would only save a few hundred. So here's the thing. Those numbers I just described map onto gun deaths in the United States. Here's a quick breakdown. There are around 45,000 gun deaths in the United States every year. Car wrecks kill about 40,000 people each year, so statistically, you're as likely to die from a motor vehicle accident as a gunshot wound, slightly more likely with a gun. Although, this was news to me, you're much more likely to die from a drug overdose, which kills about 90,000 people annually. If we're going to make a pie chart of gun deaths, it's going to look approximately like this, depending on what definition you're using. But it'll more or less look like this. 60% of gun deaths are suicide. 36% are homicides. That includes organized crime and gang violence, also crimes of passion, and indiscriminate muggings and burglaries. 3% is other accidents, legal interventions by police, or unknown. And around 1% are mass public shootings where some heinous psychopath shoots up a church or office or school. As with our Gorn example, detailed supra, it seems to me we ought to start with the larger category of homicides, consisting of rational criminal activity and irrational crimes of passion, over that of suicide and mass shootings, although we'll get to those in due course. Let's first tackle the big, looming logical deduction I referenced earlier, because we're really going to need to inform the captain about what we figure out. The thesis of more guns means more gun crime. Therefore, it would follow, less guns would equal less gun crime. Fascinating stuff. By the way, big shout out to Mr. Guy Smith, who's previously come on the show to discuss these statistics with me. Sir, you are a mintat, and if you listening at home are interested in the data on this and really knowing the background of all of this, I commend Guy Smith's book. And you could uh, also go back and listen to the episode that he appeared on. I'll put that in the, uh, the episode description today. So, the United States has more privately owned guns than any country in the world. In fact, roughly half of the entire planet's civilian gun cash is right here in the U.S. of A., a country with more guns than people, about 400 million guns for a country with a population of 330 million people. That's about 120 guns per American Although, of course, that's not evenly distributed. About a third of the people in the United States own all those guns. We also have a much higher gun murder rate than our buddies over in Europe. If we're only looking at Western Europe and our Anglophone cousins over in Canada, Britain, and Australia, there is a demonstrable correlation between our much higher gun ownership rates and much higher gun homicide rates. Although I'm discounting gun deaths overall, as that would include suicides, which I do not think is germane to this policy discussion at present. Also, uh, do note we're talking about rates rather than some totals because presumably a larger country will have more than a smaller country. Only looking at rates of firearms homicides then, the United States stands at 6.2 gun homicides per 100,000 people. 
as compared to Canada, which stands at 0.5, Australia at 0.18, and the UK at 0.04. And those numbers kind of bear out with other EU countries. We, we have a much higher gun homicide rate than them. Neither is it a situation where we have a higher gun homicide rate, but the homicide rates at large are, are basically the same. We, we use guns, they use knives and cudgels, that kind of thing. That's not the case. Europe and the white Anglosphere are less murderous and less gunly murderous than the United States, which has way, way more guns. However, we have a lower overall homicide rate than Latin America and the Caribbean. As of 2021, our overall murder rate for 100,000 people was 6.9, whereas El Salvador's was more than double that at 18, Brazil's was about the same, Venezuela's stood at 36, Honduras had 39, and Jamaica had a whopping 49, way more murders than us. We also have much higher gun ownership than any of those countries combined. When I look at America, Europe, and Latin America, there doesn't appear to be a meaningful correlation between gun rates and homicide rates. Now, we may be tempted to discount those Latin American countries because they're not in our peer group. If by peer group, we mean developed rich countries. So let's look at the homicide rates of the top 20 global economies, the G20. The United States is number five on that list. Brazil, which I mentioned earlier, is a modern developed economy. It's in the G20. It has less guns than the United States, far more homicides. Mexico, also a developed economy with fewer guns than us in the G20, has a homicide rate about five times that of the United States. And at the top of the list of homicide rates in the G20, South Africa. Incidentally, I never see statistical comparisons between the United States and South Africa when it comes to this stuff. Everybody always wants to make comparisons between America and Canada or America and England or maybe America and Australia. It would seem to me South Africa is really a better proxy. South Africa is an English-speaking former British colony with a developed economy and a massive history of racism and ongoing racial tensions, just like us. Their homicide rate is around 35 per 100,000 people. Again, ours was 6.9 last year and around five prior to everybody going nuts in 2020. So they've got a much higher rate, about seven times more homicides than we do. So we have far more murders and gun murders than European and white Anglophone countries, but far less murders than Latin America and South Africa. I do think there's one more country worth looking at specifically, and that's Switzerland. Switzerland is a developed economy. It's in Europe. It's the sort of country you'd go on spring break to, which tends to be what we use in these comparisons. It also, unlike a lot of Europe, has a gun culture, which is similar to that of the United States, and they have higher gun ownership rates than the rest of Europe. So I think that might make a good comparison. If more guns are correlated with more gun homicides, we could reasonably expect that Switzerland, having more guns than the rest of Europe and having civilian guns, would also have a higher gun homicide rate in proportion to their gun ownership rate. So Switzerland has a gun ownership rate of 27.6 guns per 100 residents, about a quarter of what we have here in the United States, but far higher than the rest of Europe. And another reason I think they're actually a pretty good comparison is, while they do have less guns in Switzerland than the United States, the amount of households where somebody owns a gun is about the same as it is over here. Or to put it another way, their gun owners own less guns, but they have the same rate of gun owners. However, Switzerland's gun homicide rate is 0.5 per 100,000 people. Much less than us. And they haven't had a mass shooting since 2001, when a man shot 14 people in a local parliament. So once again, the broad statement of more guns means more gun homicides, however intuitive that might feel to us, doesn't bear out with the data. There's not a good, it's hard to make a trend that, that fits that when I'm not cherry picking certain countries. Now, there are constitutive differences between Switzerland and the United States. We don't have the same gun laws. While that country has a high gun ownership rate compared to the rest of Europe, including semi-automatic weapons and even certain automatic weapons with a permit, they also have a different gun control regime than we do here in the States. More robust psychiatric evaluation, stronger permitting processes, stuff like that. Which perhaps we should emulate. I'm open to that. In fact, it makes way, way more sense to me to look to a country like Switzerland, which has a lot of guns and a robust historic gun culture, but not as many gun homicides or mass shootings as we do, 
and borrow their gun control ideas. That seems like a better country to emulate than, say, England, which is very different. But whenever there's a mass shooting, all the think piece types will look at England and salivate and ask, how do you avoid this carnage? And England says, well, we've always hated guns. So the first thing we did, I suppose, was to limit gun violence by sending all of our reprobate hillbilly types that would like a gun to America or Australia, leaving behind only aristocrats and submissive peasants. Then, eventually, we took all the guns because we don't have a constitution and parliament can do whatever it wants, and we also think guns are stupid. It's very common in our country. No one really likes guns over here. So we have one legal gun in the entire country, which is kept in the Tower of London, and we fire it once a year in celebration of the Queen's orgasm. Okay, that seems to work pretty well for you guys, but I don't think it'd fly over here. I don't. Uh, there's a lot going on there that just wouldn't work. What useful policies are you going to glean from the UK, which we could do over here? I, I can't find very many. We should be talking to Switzerland. Switzerland makes more sense. Yeah, well, we have all these guns, and the thing is we like guns, and we keep them in our houses in case of tyrants like Nazis and communists, but also we don't have uh, many mass shootings or very many murders. We just have um, very good clocks and chocolate and semi-automatic rifles. Yeah, we should talk to those guys. What are they doing? What what gun control programs do they have? Because I'm, I would be pretty amenable to doing whatever they're doing. It seems to be what we're shooting for over here in the states, which is precisely why, yesterday, I contacted the Swiss embassy in Washington D.C. and relayed the following message to their ambassador. Hello, ambassador. I'm researching gun homicides in the United States and note that Switzerland has relatively high gun ownership rates but much lower homicide and mass shooting rates than we do. We'd love to speak to you or your staff about Swiss gun policies. Thanks. And I'm very happy to report that this morning, His Excellency Jacques Pitelude, Swiss ambassador to the United States, responded to me with, let's try and do this soon. Alas, not in time for today's episode. Perhaps we'll do a follow-up. I am very intrigued. Okay, let's look internally now, just within the United States, to address this theorem. The amount of privately owned guns has dramatically increased over the last 30 years, while the amount of gun control laws has declined. Yet, with demonstrably more guns and successively looser gun control laws, the United States crime and homicide rate has declined. So, gun ownership is, at worst, uncorrelated to gun crime and at best an active deterrent to it. If you look at a chart of gun crime rates in the United States, it starts at 5.2 in 1968, climbs to a peak of 7.2 in 1974, and declines through the mid-80s, then climbs back up to 6.5 in the mid-90s, then absolutely plummets from 1996 until around 2017. Then in 2020, the gun homicide rate does jump up in a single year from 4.6 to 6.1. There's a lot of math to throw at you. Don't worry about that. Basically, gun homicides peaked in 1974, and they've been generally, if not significantly, declining since then up until two years ago, although it's still not that height. I'm inclined to attribute that recent uptick to COVID and lockdowns and everybody going nuts. Meanwhile, alongside this background of gun crime declining since the 70s, the amount of guns in the country has dramatically gone up. The old guns mostly stick around. Guns don't spoil. They don't go bad. You don't have to put preservatives in them. While new guns are continually added to the cache. There's no demonstrable correlation between an increase in guns and an increase in gun homicide rates here in the States. If anything, the two are inversely correlated, leading a lot of gun advocates to conclude that more guns actually reduce crime and homicide. However, I am disinclined to go that far, as crime rates also fell in much of the developed world during that same period, and those countries had stricter gun control laws. So I'm inclined to attribute that to some other primary factor. So here's what we can demonstrably say, looking at empirical data. There is no correlation between increased gun crime and increased gun ownership. Or to put it another way, there is no empirical reason to assume that doubling the amount of guns in a country would also double the homicide rate, or that having the amount of guns would have the homicide rate. Trying to limit the sheer number of guns would not be an efficacious policy to reduce gun crime. Go tell the captain. Although I do want to make a little bit of a tweak to that point. A sophisticated gun control proponent might agree with everything I've just said, but counter thusly. Yeah, there's not going to be a one-to-one -one correlation of guns to gun homicides. Somebody with six guns will not suddenly go rob a liquor store when they hit that seventh gun threshold. That's not how this works. It's not what we're claiming. We ought to think of guns more like a lottery ticket for murder. 
as the rate of guns increases in a country, there are more aggregate chances of firearm homicides. Fair enough. If that's the case, then it would seem to me our best way to reduce those murders would be to target the people buying those lottery tickets of death rather than the lottery tickets themselves, an idea which we will explore momentarily. But let's parse out a couple of things from the data we're already looking at and see if we can make a logical inference just from that. If we can identify what separates us and the other murderous countries from the less killy countries, maybe we can isolate and mitigate that factor. Okay, so let's, we're going we're gonna to switch over to inductive reasoning. Put on your, your data Sherlock Holmes and the holodeck hat. One thing which stands out in all that math that is threw at you is American gun homicides peak in 1974. Well, that's interesting. What was that about? If we can figure out why that's so high, maybe we can isolate it and beat it to death. I can't find gun homicide rates going all the way back to 1900, but I can find homicide rates in general, just not specifically for guns, but I can find the homicide rate going back to 1900. And the all-time U.S. homicide rate is a whopping 9.7 per 100,000 people in the year 1933. There's a general and steady upward climb in homicide rates from 1920 to the all-time peak in 1933. Then the homicide rate reverses and starts drifting back down to normal. So what's so special about 1920 to 1933 where it would be demonstrably correlated with higher homicide rates? American women have declared war on the demon rum. They say that what it does for paint and varnish, it'll do to your liver. I don't drink, and I will do all I can to keep you from drinking. With the bar lined with the boys and bums, spending their money, debauching their characters, rotting their bodies, and jeopardizing their immortal souls. You got it. Prohibition. Now, admittedly, alcohol consumption was off the hook back then, and it was causing all sorts of societal problems, so I understand why back in the day people thought outlawing alcohol was a good idea. But after 13 years, it was clearly an abysmal public policy failure. Alcohol consumption dropped by about 30% for a year, then it climbed right back to where it had been and exceeded it. By any metric, prohibition failed at achieving the one thing it set out to do. But even if it had succeeded, even if it had worked, the cure was worse than the disease. Because the sale, transport, and consumption of alcohol was risky, Americans increasingly favored more potent beverages. A supplier could make more money bootlegging hard liquor than beer, so that's what people drank. Because folks couldn't drink in the saloon, they made their own moonshine. Poorly. In 1927, 12,000 people died from drinking toxic bootlegged alcohol. In 1930, public health officials estimated that 15,000 people suffered from Jake Foot. Jake Foot is an old-timey disease where your hands or feet get paralyzed from drinking wood alcohol. And this is on top of all the folks the U.S. government intentionally poisoned. The feds confiscated bootlegged alcohol, then they would add soap or bitter flavors to it and release it onto the black market in hopes that the foul flavor would deter drinkers. They'd go, oh, we, we know that the government's putting soap. You don't, you don't know whether there's going to be soap in that or not. Don't drink it. It didn't work. People kept drinking it anyway. So the government moved on to actual poison. The idea being, if we tell people we're poisoning this captured alcohol and releasing it into the market, people will know it's risky to drink that alcohol and they won't sup at speakeasies anymore. Wrong. By some estimates, the federal government murdered up to 10,000 people on this idiotic gambit, people that drank federally poisoned liquor. And prohibition just permanently screwed up multiple things about our culture. It drove drinking away from public places into private homes. If you've ever wondered why English people get fun neighborhood pub culture, and we just get solitary binge drinking, that's why. And by the way, I am not shrugging off the importance of alcoholism. It is serious business. A close member of my family is a recovering and severe alcoholic, trust me, I, I know how horrible addiction is. I hate alcoholism. I wouldn't wish it on anyone or anyone's family. In the last four years, I've twice had to drive this family member to an emergency room, and I have exchanged Christmas presents at a rehab facility. But you know what? Awful as those situations were, I sure prefer hanging out at an ER room or a rehab clinic than in a prison. Alcoholism is a terrible disease, but prohibition turned it into a crime. 
There was a group called the American Association for the Study and Cure of Inebriety, founded in 1870. A bunch of admirably forward-thinking doctors who believed that drinking was not a moral failing, as most people thought, but was a disease and was something potentially treatable. And that institution shut down in the 1920s during Prohibition. Most alcohol treatment centers also closed up by 1925. What would their point be? All the alcoholics were either rotting in prison or hanging out in Congress. And there were a lot more side effects, prison overcrowding, an overwhelmed justice system, unemployment from out-of-work brewers, strained government resources, all, all sorts of things. We could do a whole episode on it, but I'm going to refrain. The main thing is, the issue pertinent to us today in trying to identify gun crime is that prohibition dramatically increased crime and homicides. Organized crime came about during prohibition, and competing gangs murdered each other with guns. Because government prohibitions create a vicious feedback loop. Last week, I could buy a Pilsner from the saloon for a nickel. Now that Pilsner's been outlawed, I gotta go to the speakeasy. But the speakeasy has to raise prices to compensate for the risk of getting caught or to pay off law enforcement officials because corruption is now rife thanks to prohibition. And because that alcohol costs more, we can actually make a higher profit margin than we were previously. So there's more of an incentive for people to get involved, particularly criminals. But they have no means to peacefully adjudicate contract disputes. They can't go to the courts and say that somebody reneged on a deal. They can't call the police and say, hey, somebody's robbing our speakeasy. So they stock up on guns for defense, and they use guns to resolve conflicts with competition. Nowadays, bars compete on prices and happy hour and wet t-shirt competitions and trivia night, that kind of thing. You hardly ever see wineries today in Napa Valley, shoot each other over territory grabs. There aren't a lot of turf war disputes in, in Bordeaux. But during Prohibition, guns and violence became the standard necessary economic tool for any form of competition or dispute amongst gangsters, a tool which drove up the price of transactions, which made alcohol more expensive, which made alcohol more lucrative, which repeated the process ad nauseum until... <laughs> The decisive vote of the 36th state against prohibition is happy news for the grain raisers of the United States and for many others throughout the land. With an eye on December 5th, work is being rushed in distilleries and bottling works. Thousands are being called back to work in plants of allied industries. At least 500,000 new jobs are predicted as a result of repeal. From keg and barrel factories, perhaps the most closely allied lines, immediate benefits from repeal extend into almost every line of business and commerce. However, everyone's not waiting until December 15th. The lid is off in many places, with the downfall of prohibition being celebrated in real old-time hilarity. Yes, and by the renewal of old acquaintances. Hotels and nightclubs report a real pre-war spirit among those revelers. Boy! Uh-oh! There'll be no more scenes such as this. Barrel after barrel of prize whiskeys destroyed by government agents. It's going to be a cold winter for the barrel busters. The homicide rate begins to drop the following year. By 1943, the national homicide rate is half of what it had been 10 years earlier during Prohibition, and it stays around that level, about five per 100,000 people, for a while, for a few decades. And then... America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. Tonight, I can report to you that we've made much progress. 37 federal agencies are working together in a vigorous national effort. And by next year, our spending for drug law enforcement will have more than tripled from its 1981 levels. This, this is crack cocaine seized a few days ago by drug enforcement agents in a park just across the street from the White House. It could easily have been heroin or PCP. The truth is, every major crime bill since 1976 that's come out of this Congress, every minor crime bill has had the name of the Democratic senator from the state of Delaware, Joe Biden, on that bill. 
Drug use has fallen by half since its peak 15 years ago. Teen drug use is leveling off and indeed may well be decreasing again. But we're a long way from my vision of a drug-free America. I know the human being and fish can coexist peacefully. Prohibition Part 2, Smokables and Snortables. Now listen, real quick. It's important to me that you trust me, Lord Uncle Heaton, to be straight with you and not pull any statistical punches, even when the data is different than I'd like. So I need to be honest and forthright about this. U.S. homicide rates climb and peak three years after Nixon launches the war on drugs in 1971. That's all true. Three years after Nixon's announcement, we have peak murder. But this is the thing I need to be forthright on. The homicide rate was already on the incline from 1966 until Nixon announces the war on drug five years later. So it's not as if everything was stable and unmurderous. And then Richard Nixon declares war on drugs, you hippies, and also black people. So while the drug war definitely correlates with an increase in homicides, it doesn't precipitate it ex nihilo. If you are an unreconstituted drug warrior, you could look at that same data that I just looked at and said, look, the drug war is clearly following and responding to homicide rates, not precipitating them. However, having established that, it would seem to me, based on all of my non-gun related research prior to this episode, that the drug war is basically just prohibition, only longer, more expensive, and with tackier menswear. All of the same externalities from prohibition apply. Remember how prohibition made booze stronger? Same thing with drugs, which might partially account for why twice as many people in the United States die from drug overdoses every year than from guns. The drug war is what drives up the price of guns and its profits and therefore makes it attractive to drug cartels, who are nasty people. Processed cocaine in Colombia costs around $1,500 per kilo, but it's sold on the streets of America for as much as $66,000. It's a high markup, friends. You don't see that kind of markup on Irish whiskey. And if you're worried, about, well, maybe it's a supply chain issue. Maybe it's, maybe the, they're, it's not that they're, they're increasing the markup. It's, it's that the boats you see, uh, gas is more expensive. All right, well, if you manufacture cheap meth here in the States, you can do that for around $300 per kilo in a clandestine lab and then sell it for about $60,000. Wheat farmland is worth about $56,000 per square kilometer. That's how much, on average, a, a kilometer of wheat farmland is. Cocaine farmland, coca farmland, that sells for $37 million per square kilometer. So they're, it, it's, it's making the drugs cost more. The drug war drives up those profit margins. As a result, the United States spends around $150 billion a year on illegal drugs. We're clearly buying a lot of drugs. The war has not stopped us from buying drugs. It has made the drugs a lot more expensive. We're still doing those drugs. That's a lot of money right there. A lot of money, which exists entirely on the black market, absent contracts or courts, which is defended and adjudicated by organized crimes and guns and gangs. Meanwhile, the government spends around $47 billion per year to try to stop that drug trade and has consistently failed since 1971. I am fairly confident if I wanted to try cocaine, I've never had cocaine, but if I wanted to, I bet you I could get some within 24 hours. And I don't know any drug dealers, and I look like the lead character from Narc the Musical, but I bet I could pull it off. Anyway, here's my thesis. After suicide, which is the biggest source of gun deaths, gun homicides are the biggest contributor to gun violence. I contend that the majority of those homicides are directly or indirectly related to the drug war, or at the very least, that drug war-related homicides, gang warfare and such, is a significant portion of the pie chart we're looking at. Now, unfortunately, I can't tell you what percentage of that pie chart is gang-related or drug-related for the very good reason that a lot of murderers don't bother leaving a note card behind them explaining why they shot up a guy. All we can definitively say is that there are about 20,000 gun homicides in the United States a year, and that some of them appear to be gang and drug related. But I will try to further delineate that to, to back up my thesis here. The National Gang Center estimates that there are around 30,000 gangs in the United States, and the FBI estimates that there are 1.4 million gang members in total. We do know that the biggest source of revenue for gangs is the drug trade, and that the biggest source of altercations between them is turf wars and the drug trade. 
According to the Department of Justice's National Gang Center, 15 to 33 percent of gun homicides in major cities, where most gun homicides are located, are linked to gang and drug activity. A 1994 Department of Justice report suggested that between a third and half of U.S. homicides were drug-related. Again, there's no way for me to make a clear definitive pie chart of the different types of homicides in the United States, but I do think it's fair to say that a minimum of 15%, probably higher, possibly much higher, maybe as much as half or more of all homicides are directly related to the drug war, minimum 15%. Meanwhile, craft brewers aren't shooting each other up over hops disputes. But let's consider one more data set on my drug war thesis. That's right, Latin America. Recall that Brazil, Honduras, El Salvador, and Venezuela, we talked about them earlier, all have much higher homicide rates than we do, let alone France and Germany. Well, what accounts for that difference? Now, my first impulse when I looked at that data was just to write those countries off as poor countries and go, nah, okay, you guys are poor, you probably just have a homicide rate that correlates with poverty. However, when I made even a cursory comparison between homicide rates and per capita GDP, there's no correlation. There are lots of countries which are as poor or more poor than El Salvador or Brazil, but have way fewer homicide rates. So that's not it. But Bolivia, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, these are all arguably narco states, or at least significant portions of them are. They are a part of the drug trade and have powerful, dangerous drug cartels operating therein. The Mexican government estimates that between 2007 and 2014, drug cartels were responsible for 164,000 homicides. Explaining Mexican drug cartels would take a whole nother episode, but suffice it to say, they are very large, very rich, and very dangerous. Uh, you can read The Cartel by Don Winslow. I interviewed him one time. Great guy. Good book. Or you could watch Better Call Saul. Fun series on Netflix. They all deal with Mexican drug cartels, and those cartels are funded by the illicit drug trade. It makes sense to me that those patterns of violence, that turf war and gun homicides, which I, I think are unquestionable in Latin America, would follow up that trade route here into the States. So my number one effective measure to reduce gun crime, if I could pick one thing just to drop the sum total of numbers, is end the drug war. We should look at drug abuse the same way we look at alcoholism, as a disease to be treated rather than a criminal problem to be prosecuted. Take that some $47 billion a year we're throwing away and instead apply that money to prevention, rehabilitation, medical services, get people help. Or if, if that's a little too liberal for you, you're, you're a little bit less touchy-feely than me. I would, I would be happy to do that, by the way. Um, what if we do this? What if we take that $47 billion and we apply it to enforcing existing gun laws on criminals who illegally purchase or own guns? Rather than trying to fund the drug war, we go, we clearly lost that one. That was one hell of a long Vietnam. Let's take that money and just try to enforce the laws that are already on the books here in the States. I think a lot of people could get behind that. Which brings us to our next biggest category of gun violence, crimes of passion. These are not indiscriminate psychotic mass shootings, nor are they criminals using a gun for illicit financial purposes, for muggings or for drug trades. By crimes of passion, what I mean is a boyfriend who shoots his girlfriend or a hothead gets into an argument at a bar and goes and gets a pistol out of his glum compartment and shoots somebody. As I said earlier, there are no clear delineating stats for drug war-related murders um, versus crimes of passion. I, I emailed Guy Smith on this, and he was really nice, and he sent me a bunch of FBI data and pie charts and things. Uh, but there's no clearly delineated data there. If you're planning to murder somebody with a gun, please send the FBI a note explaining why you did it. Also, don't murder anybody. So here's what we do know. Here's what we do know. There are around 20,000 gun homicides a year here in the States. According to FBI stats, 13% of homicide victims are family members of the shooter, and 22% are a friend or acquaintance, whereas about 48% are unknown. Maybe they're drug-related, maybe they're just miscellaneous crimes, we don't know. I think we can make a reasonable inference that somewhere between 13% and 35% of gun homicides are crimes of passion. And even if that's conservative, 
13% is still a big chunk of gun violence. So let's Spock and Scotty that data. Two policies spring to mind. Cool-off periods and background checks. Cool-off periods are implemented with the idea of compelling gun purchasers to take a deep breath, hold back for a weekend. Maybe come Monday, you won't want to shoot your wife. For example, the 1994 Brady Act implemented a five-day waiting period for gun purchases, and that cool-off period lasted five years until it was superseded by the current background check system. As of 2020, five states and the District of Columbia impose a waiting period on all firearm purchases, and four additional states have a waiting period for certain types of firearms. I think the logic to this is pretty straightforward, but again, we're doing our best to rely on inductive reasoning and workability, not deductive reasoning. I've been able to find one research paper which correlates waiting periods with a reduction in homicides. There might be more. I just haven't found them yet. The article that I found is from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and they crunch the numbers on states with gun cool-off periods, as well as during the five-year period imposed by the Brady Act. And what that paper determined was that expanding waiting periods would reduce gun homicide by 17%, or by 910 people a year. Nothing to sneeze at. Now, that's a decent chunk of gun homicides, so it's worth considering. But I have two big concerns with this research paper itself. First, the RAND Corporation reviewed 27,900 gun control studies, and they dismissed all but 123 of them as empirically invalid. They, they might be useful conversationally. They might be useful in identifying certain trends, but they, they went through a number of studies and went, these studies do not reach the qualitative threshold that we would use for conducting research. When I looked through RAND's policy sheet on waiting periods, I did not see them refer to the study I just mentioned. So apparently RAND did not consider it qualitatively useful. More to the point, however, and this is the big thing that we can back up with data rather than speculation, the majority of gun purchases in the United States are made by people who already own guns. The average gun owner owns five guns. So right off the bat, cool-off periods are already of limited marginal utility. Nobody about to commit a crime of passion is going to say, screw you, Janet. You belittled me in front of our bridge club for the last time. I'm a blast you. Ah, but I really want to shoot you with a new gun. Not one of my crummy old guns I keep in the garage. That's old hat stuff. Okay, Janet, you've bought yourself another week. Next, we know that a substantial amount of guns used for illegal purposes aren't purchased via licensed dealers who would be subject to that cooldown period. A 2004 survey of state prison inmates found that only 10% of the felons who had owned guns purchased them from a licensed dealer, whereas 70% acquired it from a friend, family member, or some dude in a parking lot or in an alley. And I, I find very similar statistics like this all the time where most illegal guns are not purchased through a above-board licensed dealer. So while a cooldown law makes rational sense to me and doesn't particularly bother me, I, I don't it doesn't seem nefarious as an imposition to lawful gun owners. It's really just kind of an annoyance. But using empirical analysis, I don't think it would accomplish very much. Okay, well, what if we preemptively try to identify the sort of jerks who blow their top and shoot their girlfriend? What if we forbid them from getting a gun? All right, now we're talking. Because it turns out there are two specific risk factors which are highly correlated with future gun crime. And they are domestic violence, and DUIs. According to Rand, in a study of mass murders from 2006 to 2016, 74% of which were shootings, 30% of familicides, 7% of mass public killings, and 3% of felony-related killings involved an offender with a known history of domestic violence. The Congressional Research Service released a report in 2015 stating that one in five mass public shootings were precipitated by domestic violence disputes. During that same period, 127 non-public mass shootings involved killing family members. So if we want to identify one single usable factor which predicts future gun crime and therefore could be used to prevent it, it's domestic violence. And here we can try to shore up our first loophole of the episode, the boyfriend loophole. Under federal law, you are not, this is right now, under existing federal law, you are not allowed to purchase a firearm if you have been convicted of domestic violence. It's already against the law. In 1994, Congress passed the Violence Against Women Act, and then in 1996, they followed it up with the Lautenberg Amendment, which prohibits anybody convicted of domestic violence, misdemeanors, or felonies from possessing firearms. 
The law applies to anyone convicted of violence against a current or former spouse, current or former cohabitant, or a co-parent of a child. The key element here, though, is spouse, cohabitation, and children. If, however, you beat up your girlfriend who lives down the street, you might be convicted of assault and battery, but you won't be convicted of domestic violence. As of 2020, 19 states and Washington, D.C. have expanded their laws to include the category of boyfriend in domestic violence. So if somebody is prosecuted in those states, it then becomes a domestic violence misdemeanor or felony, thereby removing their eligibility to purchase a gun under federal law. I suggest other states follow suit, or better, that the definition of domestic violence under federal law expands to include romantic partners in general. And I'll add to that, I would be happy to throw in stalking convictions too. While I don't have good gun homicide data available on stalking specifically, there is good data that a majority of intimate partner homicides involve a stalking incident at some point in the preceding year. So screw you guys. And incidentally, this is one of the provisions which is poised to be passed in the Senate this week. Huzzah! Closing that boyfriend loophole. Good job, gang. Congress, you're actually doing something, and it's bipartisan at that. Up next, drunks. According to a brief in injury prevention, there is a strong correlation with DUI convictions and misusing firearms. The brief found that prior alcohol-related convictions were associated with a fourfold to fivefold increase in risk of incident arrest for violent or firearm-related crimes. The authors of that study suggested implementing a policy which forbids anyone convicted of two DUIs from purchasing a gun for five years after their last incident. And I think the idea here is, one DUI, you're an idiot. Don't do that again. Two DUIs, you're a dangerous alcoholic. and You are subverting public safety. And we're not going to let you have a gun anymore. But if you can stay clean for five years, hopefully sober up, you'll regain that eligibility. Now, what I like about these two factors, domestic violence and DUI convictions, is that we're not penalizing law-abiding gun owners. We're placing limits and restrictions on them based on something somebody else is doing. Nor is it restricting a class of persons from gun purchases. We're not, we're not targeting 18-year-olds or men or some other broad category based on a statistical potentiality. Rather, we're placing restrictions on people who break the law and have already demonstrated that they are a danger to society. But if you're a responsible citizen who doesn't drive drunk or beat the crap out of your wife, it doesn't apply to you. Keep on keeping on. Okay, so we expand domestic violence to include romantic partners, and we prohibit anyone with two DUI convictions from purchasing a firearm for five years. Great. But we need to invoke Mr. Scott here. There's a problem. There's a workability problem with this. Remember, the majority of felonious gun purchases aren't bought at gun stores, where a background check would hopefully catch those DUI or domestic assault convictions. Further, according to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, which certainly sounds like the most fun federal department to work for, the average time between the purchase of a crime gun and its appearance at a crime scene is 11 years. That's a long time for a gun to change hands from the person who underwent a background check and purchased it to the person actually shooting it at another human being. So if all that's the case, if the data is very solid that a substantial amount of guns used illegally were also purchased illegally, will closing the boyfriend loophole and adding DUIs do anything? Or is it just basically feel-good window dressing? The short answer is, it wouldn't do anything. Unless we figure out a way to make background checks more solvent. So let's move on to background checks. If you're keeping score here, so far, what I've endorsed is the heavy lifting on reducing gun homicides, is ending the drug war, closing the boyfriend loophole, adding DUIs to the criteria which can preclude you from getting guns. And now we're moving on to my next big point, which is fix the national background check system. To illustrate how background checks work or don't, allow me to regale you with the story of the time I bought a gun. Don't worry, it's just a story about a gun purchase. I didn't shoot nobody. The year is 2008, and I am living in a tool shed in Los Angeles behind my best friend's house. I pay the bills working as an extra in TV and film. It didn't work out. My buddy and I decide we want to go on a road trip to San Francisco. And we notice on some event website that there's a gun show going on that weekend in that city. And I say, 
I would love to see what a gun show looks like in the most progressive city in America. Let's go to that. So we do. I join the National Rifle Association while I'm still in the parking lot, mostly because a guy offers me a free NRA hat if I sign up. And I think, well, I'd rather like to get that hat. Also, if I ever run for office as a Republican in Oklahoma, NRA membership is a prerequisite. So I, I went ahead and signed up, although I'm no longer a member in case you're curious. I think I was a member for literally the one year I paid for. There are thousands of guns inside of this large event area, and I decide I'm going to buy one. I had just read The Road by Cormac McCarthy, so at the time it seemed like kind of a good idea for me to buy something for self-defense purposes if the grid went down, or again, if I decided to run for office in Oklahoma where it's mandatory. So I identify a cool-looking vintage gun, a 308 caliber bolt-action Mauser, big heavy thing. And I approach the owner and I say, howdy, friend, I'd like to purchase this gun from you. To which he replies, no problem. Let me get your full name and info. We're going to run a quick background check on you. You can probably pick it up Monday morning. And I say, oh, never mind then. I'm, I'm actually just visiting from Los Angeles. We're driving back tomorrow. So don't, don't worry about it. And then that guy goes, well, hold on now, mister. Legally speaking, I have to run a background check on any firearms I sell as a dealer. However, the law permits me as a private gun collector to sell a collectible from my collection to a friend without going through a background check. Now, that Mauser you're holding dates from the Spanish Civil War. It's a historical artifact. So if you'd like, I can just sell it to you as a friend from my personal collection. How's that sound? And I went to the ATM, got a couple hundred bucks or whatever it was. I forget how much. And I left that gun show with a bolt-action rifle in my trunk. So when people start arguing about the gun show loophole, I, I, I perk up and go, oh, yeah, 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 I'm one, I, I did that one time. I went right through that loophole. Or more specifically, I got a gun through what might be more aptly called the private seller loophole. Here's how federal law currently works. This is just federal law. States have their own additional and differing regulations. All firearm dealers require a federal license to sell guns. And if you purchase a gun this way, at a gun store, a pawn shop, a dealer at a gun show, or even a hunting rifle from your local Walmart, they have to take your information and submit it to the FBI's National Instant Criminal Background Check System. You, the gun purchaser, fill out Form 4473, which includes 16 questions about drug use, criminal history, and other disqualifying features, along with your full name. You are encouraged, but not required to include your social security number. The firearm dealer then sends that information to the FBI, who cross-checks it with three different databases. The FBI will deny the sale if any of the following factors pop up in their database. Any felony convictions. Felons are not allowed to own or purchase guns in the United States according to federal law. Drug arrests. You're no, you can't do it if you've been arrested for drugs. The Brady Act gets a little complicated here, but I'm going to sum it up and say if you've been convicted of multiple drug violations in the last five years or convicted at all in the last year or failed a drug test in the last year, which for some reason shows up in the FBI database, you too are prohibited from buying a firearm. Ditto if you are dishonorably discharged from the military, you're an illegal immigrant, there is an open warrant for your arrest, or you have ever been involuntarily committed to a psychiatric facility. And as I mentioned earlier, if you've been convicted of domestic violence. The vast majority of these background checks are instantaneous. When they are not, the FBI has a maximum of three days to potentially deny sale. If it doesn't find a disqualifying reason within those three allotted days, the gun sale can move forward. After that, the FBI has 90 days to retroactively review that purchase, and if it determines the sale was in fact illegal, tell the ATF to go confiscate those firearms. Now, all that sounds great to me. I don't mind denying some individuals a right to armed self-defense if they've been convicted of select crimes through due process. And by the way, I doubt you do either. Unless you believe convicted criminals should be allowed to take their guns with them into prison, you're accepting my basic premise that a right to self-defense can be abrogated by due process in the name of public safety. However, the background check has lots of problems. That system has lots of problems that I've identified. And again, I would love to take the money from the drug war and shore up this Swiss cheese system we've got. For example, here's one. I was able to purchase the 308 caliber bolt action Mauser without going through one of these background checks. I was able to do so because under federal law, background checks 
only have to be conducted by licensed firearm dealers. You don't have to do a background check if you're just some guy selling your personal gun to some other guy. What most people erroneously call the gun show loophole is, as I said, better understood as a private seller loophole. Not only did I purchase my gun through this loophole without a background check, I later gave that gun away without conducting a background check. I gave it, I, I don't know where it is now. I gave it away because in my case, this is just me, personally, me, Andrew Heaton, I think it is irresponsible for me to own a firearm. I live in a neighborhood where the biggest issues are parking, humidity, and melanoma. I don't need a gun for personal defense. And on top of that, I'm a comedian and a creative person, and creative people like me tend to have bouts of melancholy. I know personally I am more at risk of getting depressed and getting drunk and shooting myself than I am of getting into a situation where I have to stave off a burglar or running for governor of Oklahoma. So I gave my gun away to a family member who is more emotionally balanced and hunts and knows guns, and I trust more than me to hold on to it. Federal law legally exempted me, just some individual guy, from giving that gun away or selling it to some other individual guy. The law only pertains to a licensed gun seller, a professional gun seller. Most gun show sale purchases go through the same background check you'd get at a store. If you're worried about the private seller loophole, I would be far less worried about gun shows than I would about websites. Armless.com is a sort of eBay for firearms. It's not a gun company you can purchase guns from. It's just a platform where private sellers sell to other private purchasers without the need for a background check because it's just two guys. They just happen to be using this website. It's difficult to get a precise number on gun sales, but the stats I've seen indicate that about one out of five guns are purchased out with that background check process. When you hear somebody calling for universal background checks, that's what they're referring to. And I'm fine with it. I'm for closing this loophole, although with some caveats. First, you'd have to have some carve-outs for temporary gun ownership. Temporary. For example, let's say I am going bear and or quail hunting with my buddy Evan on Saturday, and I leave my guns at his house Friday night. A background check doesn't really make sense in that instance for several reasons. Well, I'm not really giving Evan the gun. He's just temporarily storing them for me. So we would need to exempt him from that and at least say he's not a criminal for having it in the back of his car. Requiring us to go to a police station would seem onerous in that instance. And if you're thinking that's not onerous, requiring somebody to make sure that anyone they give a gun to is able to wield that gun, that is a basic civic obligation. Okay. I, I'm not going to fight you on that, but how are you going to make anybody do that? What's the enforcement mechanism? If a cop happens to swing by Evan's house and for some reason Evan shows him his guns and he goes, hey, is that gun yours? Evan can go, yeah, it's my gun. Sorry, I lost the receipt. I, I don't know how you would, for that kind of thing, I don't know how you would enforce it. Another example, let's say I am suicidally depressed and I call Evan and I go, hey, Evan, I don't think as a depressive comedian that I should have firearms at the moment. Would you hold on to these for me until I get my head together? By the way, I'm really looking forward to going bear and or quail hunting with you when that happens. Well, that's a responsible thing to do. We don't want to criminalize that. We don't want to criminalize Evan or myself for that kind of thing. And uh, we also don't want to erect speed bumps that would compel me, in this instance, the depressed guy, to refrain from seeking help for fear that I'm going to have my guns taken away. That's actually the last thing we want to have happen is people that need mental health not going to get mental health. The Brady Campaign, which if you're unfamiliar with it, this is a gun control advocacy organization. It is by no means an NRA style gun advocacy group. They suggest exempting transfers between spouses and close family members of private guns for these reasons that I just told you. Presumably, dads are going to give their sons hunting rifles regardless of what this rule is. There's no way to enforce that. They're not going to run a background check. It would be pretty impossible to ask them to. But we could say nobody can purchase a gun from a stranger online or at a gun show without passing a background check. And at least in those instances, I think you could have a law enforcement mechanism because they could be at the gun show or they could audit websites. It would be next to impossible to stop your Uncle Zeke from selling his blunderbuss to a friend in a parking lot, but gun shows and websites, those are something I think law officials could actually intervene in. It seems to me the easiest way to close up the private seller loophole without violating a purchaser's privacy rights would be to require parties to go to a licensed gun seller or pawn shop and have them conduct the background check, or alternately go to a local police station and have them do it. 
And I think the cost of these background checks should be borne by the government and not the buyer or seller as they are now. If we're imposing these restrictions on private citizens for the good of public safety, then that cost ought to be paid for all of us enjoying that public safety through our collective taxes. We should also include a clear, swift appellate process for people who have been wrongfully denied their right to buy a gun due to quirks in the database. People who happen to have the same name as a convicted felon, for example, who get wrongfully flagged. And I would add that if your appeal is successful and it required the help of attorneys, the government ought to comp the attorney fees for up to $10,000 or something like that so that otherwise law-abiding but poor citizens aren't priced out of their rights. But I identify one big problem with the national background check system. You ready? It sucks. The participation of state and local governments to supply disqualifying criteria such as domestic assault or felonies is optional. This blew my mind when I read it. I'm going to repeat that. The participation of state and local governments to supply disqualifying criteria such as domestic assault or felonies is optional. Some states like Connecticut are pretty good about uploading their felonies to the FBI database. Other states don't bother. And even federal agencies for whom participation is mandatory, managed to drop the ball. In 2012, the Air Force court-martialed David Patrick Kelly for assaulting his wife and child and sentenced him to 12 months of confinement. As we now know, you cannot legally purchase a gun if you are dishonorably discharged or convicted of domestic assault. Technically, the Air Force discharged him on grounds of bad conduct rather than dishonorable discharge, but that bad conduct was nonetheless domestic assault, which should have precluded him from passing a background check except that the Air Force didn't bother to send that conviction to the FBI's NICS database. So he purchased a Ruger AR-556 and in 2016 opened fire inside First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs, Texas, killing 26 people. But that's just an anecdote of federal incompetency. The NICS database maintained by the FBI theoretically has access to all data from federal convictions, but its access to state, local, and tribal court convictions is dependent on those respective bodies optionally supplying that data. That's because a Supreme Court ruled in Prince v. U.S. that a federal statute requiring states to disclose their internal criminal records violated the Tenth Amendment. I can think of a few ways to shore this major datalogical blind spot up without requiring a rewrite of the Constitution or overturning Supreme Court decisions. The first and easiest way would be for individual states to just better participate in the NICS database work on streamlining and integrating their information with the FBI. If they're not currently sending that info, send it. Alternately, states could conduct their own background checks based on their own data, which would happen coterminously with the FBI as a separate background check. And from what I've read, the state ones would probably be more effective. Now, all of that said, fortunately, it's possible that this issue, which seems to me to be the biggest issue for Nix, is already getting the kinks worked out, although it's I don't know if it's resolved yet or how efficacious it's been, but in any event, the federal government has attempted to assuage these problems. In 2017, Texas Senator John Cornyn and Connecticut's Chris Murphy jointly wrote the Fix NICTS Act, which penalized federal agencies for failing to submit required data and offered federal block grants to states to incentivize them to voluntarily participate in said database. And that law was signed in 2018 by President Trump. Quick shout out to John Cornyn. I have gained a lot of respect for that guy over the last three weeks in researching all of this. A Republican senator in Texas authoring gun legislation with Chris Murphy is an act of political bravery in my estimation, and he is walking a very difficult line. John Cornyn is a staunch proponent of the Second Amendment. I don't think anybody is second-guessing him on gun rights, but he has nonetheless stepped up multiple times now to try to maintain those gun rights that he believes in while also keeping guns out of the hands of lunatics and criminals and trying to strengthen that system that stops that. At the moment, the Senate appears poised to pass a bipartisan gun bill. This is, as, as I'm recording this, they're actively working on one. And in that, Cornyn is a key figure. One of the additional fixes he's added to the background check system is to allow juvenile records, hitherto not included in the background check process, to be included in that database. Although, it's yet to be seen whether these things will arrive at the floor and whether they will actually be voted on. Either way, whether you are a staunch gun rights advocate or a gun control advocate, I think John Cornyn deserves our respect on this issue. Anyway, let's return to background checks. 
And let's assume Chris Murphy and John Cornyn are indeed able to shore up that moldering NICS database, streamline it, get all the disqualifying state and local data uploaded and so forth. Great. There's still the main big looming problem with background checks. Namely, criminals aren't going to buy guns from anyone conducting a background check. And otherwise benign individuals like your Uncle Zeke may not bother doing one if the process is cumbersome and there's no chance of getting caught. Now, I do think we could close the private seller loophole for gun shows and online sales, but those guns and trunk purchases, nefarious or otherwise, are effectively voluntary. So again, we return to a common feature of gun control legislation. Sounds good to me, but is it just meaningless window dressing that would perhaps irritate the law abiding and have no effect on the criminal? Even marginally intelligent criminals are going to evade the background check system by getting their buddy who can pass a gun to go buy that gun for them. The ATF reports that nearly half of all illegally trafficked firearms originate via straw purchases. Close up the private seller loophole and we can reasonably infer that that number of straw man purchasers is going to go up. So why bother? That is, I think, the strongest criticism of universal background checks because, at least as of now, unless you add the DUI thing, we're not talking about expanding who can or can't own a gun. We're just talking about expanding the transactions to already existent federal law. But the efficacy of them is dubious. Straw man purchasers and black market deals render them useless. So the law only affects law-abiding people who we don't need to worry about anyway, right? However, I think we can at least say that the national background system is a speed bump to violent crime, and its effective expansion would have some degree of utility. In the first 21 years of operation, the NICS background check system resulted in 865,000 denials. 189,000 of them were fugitives, and 212,000 of them were domestic offenders. The bar for disqualification based on mental health is very high. You have to be involuntarily committed. But the NICS system has blocked 43,000 such people. So we do have data indicating that the background check system has blocked purchases of firearms to several hundred thousand people who would be proscribed from getting it by law. Maybe some of them went on to go get it through straw purchases and so forth. But again, at least it might affect a speed bump. I've seen suggestions that because so few people are actually prosecuted, for willfully trying to buy a gun illegally who've been flagged by the NICS system, that most of those numbers must be false positives. However, I looked into this. According to a 2017 audit of the Office of the Inspector General, 99.8% of background check denials were accurate. The FBI likewise estimates a 99.3 to 99.8% accuracy for the half million denied transactions they've done from 2008 to 2014. So again, we have numbers that the system does block some people. Although I don't think background checks will really ever do a lot to deter intelligent career criminals. And while we're jumping ahead here, even if background checks worked flawlessly, I don't see a lot of evidence that they would do much to stop mass shooters. That's a whole other issue, but just to, to cut in on that, this is not going to solve for that. I'm perfectly happy to fix, potentially even expand the system, but it, it's folly to say universal background checks would make any significant impact on mass shooters for reasons we might cover later. But remember, at the moment, we're not trying to solve for those guys. We're career criminals. That's why we already talked about the drug war. We're trying to reduce crimes of passion, not gang members selling cocaine or psychopaths shooting up churches, but just garden variety boyfriends who get drunk and shoot girlfriends. Incidentally, another thing I learned over the course of researching this, there is a 10% increase in domestic violence after an upset loss with local National Football League teams. Anyway, for that guy, the dumb shit wife beater, I think the efficacy of universal background checks hinges on one factor. How irritating is it for the person selling him the gun? Here's my thinking. We can break down private gun sellers into two categories. People who, if they knew you were uneligible to purchase a gun, would care about that fact and refrain from selling it to you. And people who don't care and would sell it to you regardless. Frankly, there's not a lot we can do about those people in the second category. Guns aren't registered. There are a lot of guns. Unless, for some reason, you're being targeted by the ATF, you could probably sell it out of your trunk and no one would ever know. So um, there's a, a big issue there. But for the people who do care, I think this largely boils down to a matter of convenience. If Uncle Zeke has to fill out a bunch of paperwork and call the feds and pay a fee, 
Maybe Uncle Zeke will say to hell with it and sell the blunderbuss to the guy anyway. That said, if it's relatively easy, I think Uncle Zeke would probably proceed through the motions. Now, where I'm at, I don't think requiring background checks for gun transfers to non-family members constitutes such a huge inconvenience. There are 59,000 unique gun dealers across the country, which is to say there are more federally licensed firearm dealers than there are McDonald's and post offices combined. 99% of Americans live within 10 miles of one. I would further include police stations for this purpose, which would increase that. And as I said earlier, I don't think the buyer or seller should be paying for it. I think that should come out of general taxes. Telling people they have to swing by a gun store or police station before selling a gun simply as a matter of being a responsible citizen to make sure the guy's not a nutball or a, a wife beater or a felon, that does not sound onerous to me. And it also sounds much more fun than going to the DMV to get new tags for my car, which I got to do anyway. But that's just me. And I will admit that this is subjective and I am not trying to sell anybody a gun. So it's entirely possible I am missing out on some stuff and I don't fully appreciate the irritants of this. So I have come up with a plan to make background checks even more convenient for buyers and sellers. Or rather, I have plagiarized and modified a plan from former Oklahoma Republican Senator Tom Coburn. You ready for this? This is my plan. This is my plan that I think would actually take care of and shore up significantly the private seller loophole. TSA Pre for guns. Here, hold on, wait, hold on now. Here's what I'm thinking. In order to get a TSA pre-gun card, we'll come up with a better name later, but you know what I mean by that. You have to pass a federal background check and a state background check. In addition to existing federal law, you're disqualified if you've had more than two DUIs in the last five years, per that whole thing I talked about earlier. You've passed that. Next, you have to pass a basic gun competency test. As administered by your local gun club or police station or National Guard unit will work out how we would do that. But some sort of basic gun competency test, basic stuff, by the way, that anybody that grew up with guns already knows how to properly load a gun, basic gun safety, the ability to discharge a firearm in the general vicinity of your target. All you're doing is establishing that you're competent with firearms. If we wanted to get fancy, maybe gamify it. You could get a little extra eagle or award on your card if you took Supplemental classes on stuff that we just like for people to know anyway, like conflict resolution, CPR, first responder stuff. But that would all be optional and bonus. I don't want to make this onerous, right? That's just in case you're already there and you want to do it. Basically, you have to pass a federal background check, state background check, and minimal firearm competency test. Once you've passed those three elements, you get your TSA pre-gun card. Congratulations. Here's why you want this card. Why it would be worth it to you to go through this process. You no longer have to get background checks when you buy firearms because you already did. You've already gone through that system. Now you can just show them your card. It's a federally valid ID with your picture on it. Show that at the gun show or the gun store or the pawn shop or wherever, and they just look at the back, call the hotline, type in your ID number, and an automated voice says, yep, Uncle Zeke is confirmed. But wait, there's more. If you own this card... The federal government will rebate you the cost of sales tax on gun purchases up to, I don't know, $1,000 a year. How about that? Enough that it's worth the hassle to you to go get your background check and hang out at a gun range for a day. We could tinker with that number, but I don't have a problem as a taxpayer trying to encourage people to enfranchise into this system. And we could require you to get revalidated every five years or something. Now, once we have these available, we tell private sellers, the law now is... If you want to transfer a firearm to someone other than your immediate family, which you can just do, you either have to go get a background check with them at a gun store or a police station, or you just have to confirm the person you're selling the gun to has one of these TSA pre-cards. Uncle Zeke, you don't got to drive anywhere. You don't have to fill out any forms. You don't have to pay anything. You just got to make sure that dude that you're selling the blunderbuss to has one of these cards, then call the hotline and it goes, yep, he's good. That's it. It is my suspicion, and I realize I've, I've tipped the deck that I'm a comedian that lives in Austin, Texas. As I think I also mentioned, I'm from Oklahoma. I would say I'm from gun-adjacent culture. And I, tons of people in my family own guns. I grew up around it, right? It is my suspicion as a guy from middle America that's hung out in those circles that there's a lot of decent law-abiding people 
sorts of folks from whom I'm descended, who would not willfully sell a firearm to a convicted felon or wife beater if they knew about it. But at the moment, there's no real reason for them to discover that fact when they're doing a private sale. In this system, the TSA pre-gun system, I think the Uncle Zeke's of the world would say, yeah, okay, I'll only sell guns to people I can personally vouch for, or if I don't know them, they've got to have a TSA pre-gun card. So while I don't think universal background checks are apt to make much impact on career criminals, or alas, on mass shooters, I do think we could better the system and potentially knock out some of the hotheads. Now, before we move on, there is another issue to address with background checks, and that's the Charleston loophole. As I mentioned earlier, the FBI has three days to issue a green light or red light on a background check. If it's indeterminate by day three, the sale can go through and the FBI can try to repossess the gun retroactively if they later determine that the transaction was unlawful. Now, I, I like the idea of having systems that default on the side of the citizen rather than the government. I don't have any ideological problem with that at all. But the practical problem is that three days is oftentimes insufficient to weed out gun sales, which would already otherwise be illegal if the FBI were able to promptly identify the disqualifying criteria. The Charleston loophole is so called because in 2015, a lunatic attempted to purchase a gun, but the FBI could not complete his background check in the allotted three days. So he did. It turns out he should have been ineligible to purchase that weapon, but instead he obtained it and proceeded to enter a black church in Charleston and gun down and kill nine people. Between 2006 and 2015, over 6,000 firearms were transferred to people convicted of misdemeanor domestic violence whose convictions didn't surface within that three-day default. And in 2017, at least 1,200 felons and 500 people currently under indictment purchased firearms because of this three-day default rule. The FBI estimates that about 3,000 people a year pass Nick's background checks despite legal qualifiers. However, I should note, pursuant to the mission of this here starship, I have not seen data on how many gun crimes are actually committed by these individuals, which does make this loophole tirade that I'm going on run afoul of my earlier promise to try to focus on numbers and efficacy. But since we're already here and we're educating ourselves in the background process, I thought it would be worth bringing up. Proponents of closing the Charleston loophole want to do the following. Expand that default purchase from three days to 10 days. That's it. It gets a little bit more complicated, but basically right now it's three days, then you can buy the gun and they can retroactively take it. People want to close the, the loophole, go, let's expand that, uh, ex expand that to 10 days. Give, give the FBI an extra week to do that. Now, it is my understanding that the forthcoming bipartisan gun bill is poised to do this in a limited capacity for individuals 21 and under, but not for everybody, which makes sense to me. I'm, I'm fine with this. I'm, I'm, it seems to me that we're, we've got it too low at the moment, although... If I'm going to be Spock about it, and that was my promise to you, we actually need to look at two relevant sets of data to make a determination on expanding a waiting period like that, an effective waiting period like that. The first one is, how many crimes are committed by these illegally purchased weapons? The second is, how many crimes are deterred or avoided by people who would otherwise have been victimized if they'd had to wait more days, i.e., the Spock approach is to look at the net negative or positive of this extension, if at all possible. However, I am going to refrain from further doing that research for now because, my God, this has been a long episode, and I am at significant risk of becoming a full-time gun stats researcher, which is a distraction from my real passion in life, becoming the Swiss ambassador to the United States. I'm taking Swiss language lessons right now. I may very well do a follow-up on... Uh, gun control legislation, gun policies, um, gun statistics, things like that. This is, I cannot stress how massively complex this field is. I thought I worked hard on the Roe v. Wade episode that I did last month. I only had to learn jurisprudence for that. I basically put myself through half a semester of law school. That was much easier than this episode because I'm having to do quantitative analysis, international comparisons, learn law, learn engineering. It's very, very complicated. We're done for now. However, we might return to this and do other issues. So in the meantime, let me say this. Regarding raising age limits, abolishing gun-free zones, red flag laws, and assault weapon bans, all interesting stuff to consider that I might do later. If you want to Spock and Scotty those positions on your own, here are two good questions to begin with. You should apply this. If, if, we're, if we're taking the Spock and Scotty and data approach, 
This ought to be asked of any potential plan. If the proposal completely worked, how many gun deaths would it solve for? Next, if somebody didn't care about this law, how easy would it be for somebody to circumnavigate it? Those are two really big logical considerations to apply to any policy proposal. Finally, I would try to determine the net benefit by weighing positive and negative externalities. A moment ago, I mentioned that if we're going to try to look at expanding that default gun purchase period, it would be most helpful for us to know if that is going to have negative externalities of depriving people of a right to self-defense that really do need it during that intervening time and get shot. If there's more of those people than the other people, then that would be a major consideration against it. Similarly, uh, red flag laws are, are being floated in the, the Senate bill that is uh, being discussed at the moment, or rather, um, the Senate bill might provide block grants to incentivize states to do their own red flag laws or something to that effect. Makes sense to me. Uh, in my case, uh, I don't want to I don't want to get too personal about this, but uh, my Memorial Day weekend, I had to cancel a comedy show to uh, drive to a different city and take a loved one to the emergency room due to uh, alcoholism. And on the way up, this person who is not uh, coherent or pliable or anything else positive while drunk, I was informed, had probably purchased a gun. And so I had to um, talk to this person's mother and assure her that when I got to his apartment that I would ask him to open the door and put the pistol on the ground and slide it out, and then I would take it, and then we would go to the hospital and... Uh, um, fortunately, that, it, it, none of that happened, by the way. Um, this person was very helpful and, and came down with me, and, and all, I, I don't want to get into all of that. My point is, uh, I, I understand the idea behind red flag laws. They make sense to me. There are situations where somebody's a nut job or they're suicidal or they're really just drunk and a little bit dangerous, and they don't need to have a gun at that time. I, I like the idea of them. However, going back to this Spock and Scotty thing, what would be relevant to this conversation from a data analysis perspective is how many clearly unhinged people who have been temporarily relieved of guns are there versus how many unhinged people wind up getting into a shootout and dying or killing a cop or somebody else when the cops try to take their guns. That's a relevant data analysis to do. Uh, if there's way, way, way more people that we think probably would have killed somebody or injured somebody that are forestalled by red flag laws, um, then the preponderance of evidence from a data perspective would be on that side. However, if, if you were to crunch the numbers and go, actually, it turns out when we send cops to people's houses, it tends to freak them out, and then they get in a, a shootout with the cops and they end up dying anyway, well, then that would be a counter-effective law, would it not? All right, now I will note, there's lots of these other things we could talk about. Based on my research, uh, you know, Greater restrictions on semi-automatic weapons, uh, increasing age requirements, uh, things like that. Based on my research so far, I think that all of those other things would be of demonstrably lesser impact on reducing gun crime than what we've already discussed today. Um, not to say they're a horrible idea, just to say that they're probably marginal at best based on what I've seen. If uh, if you've got a gun control thing that, that we ought to cover on the show in the future that um, you could begin by saying this would potentially solve for X amount of people, and here's why it would be effective. I'm, I'm open to that, but it seems to me that the ones we've already covered are probably going to be more effective than a lot of the other things that we didn't cover today, which again, to summarize for you, are end the drug war, add multiple DUI convictions to the category of prohibited gun buyers, and fix the leaky NICS background system so that it is more effective in screening out and applying already existent federal law. Those three things seem to me to be the best ways to drastically reduce the number of gun deaths in this country. There might be other good ideas, but at least on my end, they seem to be of, of lesser impact in terms of sheer numbers of lives saved. Now, there's still a lot to cover. We didn't get to mass shootings, and I realize they are Horrible, and that's what we're all thinking about, right? We're thinking about mass shootings. We're not thinking about these sort of bulk numbers that I've been doing. And uh, I would uh, I would like to cover that, but it would take a whole other episode to do that. 
And there's other topics as well that we might hit. So this is what we're going to do. Patrons. Patrons of the show. I'm going to put up a poll on Patreon, and you can choose the topic of the follow-up gun episode to today's program. And here are the suggestions I have. We could do an episode on mass shootings, the causes, the statistics, the solutions. I'm sure that there'd be a bunch of interesting things I would learn that I don't currently know. We could do an episode on guns and constitutional law, where we talk about D.C. versus Heller and why the Supreme Court ruled that cities can't ban handguns. There have been some other it hasn't gotten to the Supreme Court case or the Supreme Court yet, but there's been other cases where states have tried to suspend certain guns from certain age groups, and those have been struck down by the courts, right? So we could do a, a, a constitutional law one on on gun rights and, and what has been struck down by courts. We could do an ideological episode on guns as self-defense against criminals and tyranny, and I would probably get into the history of gun confiscation going back to the Huguenots. Or... What are those Swiss up to? I'm still interested in that. What does gun control look like over in Switzerland? I really want to find out. Hopefully, hopefully me and the ambassador can can uh, hang out and go get margaritas or something. Anyway, I'll do whatever the Patreon poll says, but probably not for a couple of weeks. I am tapped out on this. I need to catch my breath and not think about gun statistics for a day or two. I've been, all my friends have just been bugging, explaining all the stuff going through my head, and you're not even hearing all the stuff that didn't make the cut on today's episode. All right, <clears throat> before we sign off, the winner of last week's How Many Dogs Can You Pet Challenge is a tie between Brittany Billicky and Jennifer Roche, who both pet an estimated 70 to 80 dogs each, although both also noted they do work with dogs on a daily basis, I think at animal shelters, possibly at a, a veterinary clinic, so they have an unfair advantage. But you know what? That wasn't specified in the rules. Congratulations, Brittany and Jennifer. Ladies, you are the very first winners of the Wallace Winner Challenge. I will send you your prize in the next couple of days. Patrons, this week's challenge is send me the funniest picture you can find of an animal in a costume. Whoever sends me the funniest animal in a costume picture will be the winner of the next Wallace Winner Challenge. And if you want to get in on that sweet, sweet competition... Go to patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton. Listener, I have one question for you. Just one question. Are you glad somebody's doing this? Do you think very many people in political media are doing the research and number crunching and literally calling the Swiss embassy to find out and explain what's going on? I don't know what you did for your Memorial Day, but I spent it entirely going through international gun crime statistics to try and better this show and really do my due diligence and be earnest and thoughtful and um, put in some, some real elbow grease on this, right? So if you're glad somebody is doing actual research and trying to inform you rather than just offering you confirmation bias or ranting about the bad team, please consider supporting the show. This is an independent program. I do not receive corporate sponsorship. I don't get any grants from political action committees. I just have you guys. And I would not have time to do this kind of in-depth analysis if this weren't my day job. It took a stupid amount of time. So if you think, I wish more of the media did funny deep dives like that Heaton guy, well, here's your chance to push the needle that direction. Show sponsorship starts at $3 a week which, if you think about it, is less than a cup of coffee at your average gas station. If we lived near each other, and you saw me once a week at the gas station, and I said, hope you're enjoying the show, would you mind buying me a cup of coffee? I bet you would. I think you'd go, this is a good show, I'll give you a cup of coffee. Well, here's how you do it. You go to patreon.com slash Andrew Heath. All right. The show's pretty much over, and we're done with policy analysis for the day. Uh, well, one more thing. We're going to talk about suicide for a minute. The only remaining policy thing that I want to say, because I didn't cover this earlier in the program, there is absolutely no statistical correlation between how many guns are in a country and what the suicide rate is. There is a correlation between the type of thing you use to kill yourself and the availability of guns, but the actual numbers of suicides are uncorrelated with that. But what I mean by that is um, if you have a lot of guns in your country, it's probably going to be how people commit suicide, but the guns don't 
don't lend themselves to higher or lower amounts of suicide. I've, I've gone through the numbers on this. It's just it's just not coordinated. So anybody attempting to mitigate suicide by uh, limiting the amount of weapons is not going to be effective in doing that. So, okay. Class is dismissed. That's it. No more policy stuff. In fact, if you're having a good day and you have a pretty good life, things are going well in general, you don't need to listen to any of what follows. We're done. Truly, you can skip the rest of this episode and go check out another podcast. Check out We're Not Wrong. I have a new panel show that I'm on with Jen Briney and Justin Robert Young. It's called We're Not Wrong. It's a lot of fun. A very fun show. Before we go, though, I do feel the need to discuss suicide. It came up at the beginning of the program, and I dismissed it as non-germane, which I do think from a gun control perspective it is, which, as you'll recall, accounts for more than half of all gun deaths in the United States. Reducing suicide would be, if we could pick one thing to take a whack at, that would be the number one thing we could do to reduce gun deaths. But whatever policy solutions are available to do so, and I suspect that the things that the government can do are probably fairly indirect, they are presently outside the scope of today's research. Uh, perhaps we'll do a, a mental health episode in the future. I would be interested in doing so. But I do know that given the size of this audience, there's an almost statistical certainty that somebody listening right now is in a bad place. If that's you and you're in a dangerous spot, call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Again, policy part of the episode's wrapped up, guys. If you were here for gun control in Star Trek, mission accomplished. At this point, I just want to talk to the sad people. If you're a happy person, you can go tickle your wife or play flag football or go parasailing, all the stuff happy people do in erectile dysfunction commercials, happy people activities, but sad people. I want you to hunker down with me for a minute. Everybody else can go. If you're sad, I want you to listen. I've never been on the ledge before, on the edge, standing on that precipice, actively thinking about jumping. But there have been several times now where I have been close enough to see that ledge Maybe you relate. Maybe you've been on the edge. Maybe you've, maybe you're close there now. I mean, it's disturbing, particularly the first time you realize that that is a possibility. I've been on antidepressants twice before, not for long periods of time, but I've I've been on them a couple times. The last one was very recent. At my annual checkup this year, my doctor was going through the list and he went, "Are you sleeping well? Any depression issues?" And I went, "Well, yeah, I'm sleeping okay, and I I'm not. I don't." I'm not depressed. I'm not suicidal or anything, but I do. Well, I think about suicide a lot, uh, like in kind of like an abstract sense of like under what circumstances I do it, um, how long I would wait to do it, uh, kind of peripheral suicidal issues. Does that count? And he went, um, I'd like to try getting you on some mild antidepressants. And about a month later, which is about how long it would take for those to kick in in my case. I found myself one morning just singing, and I realized, oh, wow, I was pretty depressed. I didn't even realize it. Jesus, my brain was malfunctioning, kind of like in Star Trek, the original series, season three, episode one, Spock's brain. And I'm, I'm fine, by the way. I'm fine. I'm in a good place. I, nobody needs to reach out to me or check up on me or anything like that. I'm good. This is all to say, if you listening, if any of this resonates with you, there is absolutely nothing wrong or embarrassing about seeking help. Nobody would think less of you for asking a doctor for insulin if you had diabetes. Nobody would think you're flimsy or weak if you got a cast for a broken arm. The same thing goes for malfunctioning brains, which many of us apparently, including me at least sometimes, seem to have. If you ever get into that weird brown-colored glasses funk that I mentioned, where you can't remember happiness, it just seems utterly unobtainable, or that you've been on the edge or you've seen the edge, please go talk to a professional. That is the responsible, 
rational thing to do. Scotty and Spock would tell you to go see Dr. McCoy, who would presumably say, Damn it, I'm a doctor, not a psychiatrist, but I can give you a referral. Life is kind of hard, and we need all hands on deck to help each other to get through it. So please take care of yourself. Ugh, man, that's a downer in an episode on Ugh, God. You know what? While I don't normally do that, I try to leave on a happy note. If that helps one person, if one person's going to call a doctor that needs to call a doctor, great. I do not mind ending the episode on an earnest note and revealing a little bit of vulnerability to you all instead of doing a funny advertisement, which would have been kosher chewing tobacco. Must be 12 to purchase. Anyway, that's the show. Thanks for listening. Thank you, everybody, who sent me suggestions on gun policy topics, and in particular to Guy Smith and Charlie Landers, who have been very gracious to help me with research. Thank you, Eric Stipe, who edited today's lengthy program. And thank you, patrons of the show, who make it all possible. You can join them by going to patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton. Until next time, I've been Andrew Heaton, and so have you.